The world of food is undergoing an immense change today. Thanks to TV, cookery shows of all kinds are being beamed into our homes and grabbing the attention of all of us Indians. Inevitably, food and chefs from countries around the world are developing their own fan bases and markets in India. Celebrity chefs are like rock stars in today's day. Indian chefs too are slowly making their mark on the global stage. The latest being Garima Arora, winning the prestigious Michelin star last year. She joins a small but growing number of Indian celebrity chefs who have achieved success overseas. Her Bangkok restaurant, Ga, joins a small list of highly regarded and rated Indian restaurants around the world. For a country with such an incredibly culinary heritage, with a massive range of cooking styles, a vast array of recipes from so many regions of India, with varied influences, heady aromatic flavors, bewildering spread of ingredients, cooking techniques, India should be a global foodie's paradise from fine dining to street food. It's a pity that India is not a player in the $3 trillion global food business. In the UK, Indian food has come a long way since 1809 when Dean Muhammad set up the first restaurant dedicated purely to Indian cuisine. The chicken tikka masala, now being proclaimed as the British national dish since 2001, according to former Foreign Secretary Robin Cook, currently employing about 100,000 people and contributing 4 billion British pounds to the Exchequer. That's the size of the Indian restaurants in the UK. 90% of these restaurants are run by Bangladeshis. It's also true that the quality of fare at most Indian restaurants around the world leaves much to be desired. Started by untrained, uneducated immigrants, these restaurants are set up out of necessity, not choice. They are small, smelly, dingy, not with the best decor, unprofessionally run, untrained staff, self-taught cooks, producing unimaginative, oily, unhealthy food in unhygienic conditions. A 2015 Washington Post article lamented, Many point to the fine culinary skills needed to create quality Indian cuisine which results in higher prices. Everyday Americans don't expect to pay above a certain price for food, which leaves only subpar Indian food as an option. And once you've had bad Indian food, it takes a while to want to roll the dice again. An estimated 3 million Indians among the wealthiest and educated live in America. And yet there are just over 5,000 Indian restaurants compared to over 40,000 Chinese restaurants across the US and about 50,000 Mexican restaurants. There are also 300,000 Thai Americans in the US, less than 1% the size of the Mexican American population. Yet an estimated 5,300 odd Thai restaurants are there in the US compared to around 54,000 Mexican restaurants. That's 10 times the population to restaurant ratio of the Mexican American ones. How did this happen? Under a Thai government initiative, gastro diplomacy or culinary diplomacy became an instrument of Thailand's strategic foreign policy to drive revenues, tourism, as well as enhance Thailand's image on the world stage. An elaborate plan involving multiple ministries with marketing, funding support to entrepreneurs was created. And today, more than 15,000 Thai restaurants around the world serve as ambassadors of their country and culture. Thailand isn't alone. Peru, Taiwan, Malaysia, South Korea, Japan, US, and even North Korea, with its over 100 restaurants across Asia, are using food as a means of diplomacy. Academic institutions like the University of Southern California have culinary diplomacy as part of their public diplomacy program, bringing out issues on gastro diplomacy, while the American University has a gastro diplomacy course with sessions on topics like, is the kitchen the new venue of foreign policy? There is even the Le Club des Chefs des Chefs, an association of 18 chefs of heads of state who use culinary diplomacy to strengthen international relations through their work at the White House, Rashtrapati Bhavan and other places to promote their national kitchens. India hosted these chefs in 2016. Gilles Bragard, the founder of this club said, chefs are great diplomats and good food always helps in easing negotiations. The idea of using cuisine for diplomatic reasons, soft power if you will, for furthering relations with other countries isn't of course new. It's been used for hundreds of years by businessmen, monarchs and ambassadors. World leaders and politicians negotiate hard and long, often bitterly, frustratingly and sleeplessly. 
but they still have to eat. So why not break bread with each other in more relaxed environments? Johanna Mendelssohn Foreman, an adjunct professor at American University says, food humanizes people, it humanizes your adversaries. During the 20 months of negotiations for the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, tensions were high and the talks nearly collapsed at least five times, according to the New Yorker. Negotiators had always eaten separately, but on the 4th of July, America's Independence Day, the Iranians extended an invitation for the two sides to break bread together. No shop talk allowed. It was the first time that the Iranians and the Americans looked at each other differently, says Ms. Mendelssohn Foreman. They saw each other as negotiators first, agrees Dr. Berlin. And then they saw each other as people. Within 10 days, an agreement was finally reached. Both experts convinced it was made possible by the Persian meal the two sides shared and the rapport it helped foster. Food is something most people enjoy consuming. Food is a sensory experience with all five senses involved in its consumption. Seeking variety in food is growing more common, especially in the era of globalization. Thanks to rising incomes, travel, media coverage of food through blogs, TV programs, events, chefs, restaurants, street food, and the availability of affordable and different varied cuisine. People are becoming more adventurous. Chefs are becoming more experimental. Fusion foods are the rage, along with expectations of healthy, tasty, quality food that is different. The West has created, curated, and disseminated standards, certifications, processes, technologies, cooking, restaurant management schools, and many other elements that everyone else aspires to achieve and be part of. Sadly, we in India haven't thought along these lines. Isn't it time that India considers that its extraordinary culinary heritage as a means of diplomacy, tourism, revenue generation? A strategic mission for the country, one that mobilizes its diplomatic core and embassies and encourages the private sector to set up training centers, certifications for Indian food, trains chefs and other personnel, kitchens, creates sourcing channels for various ingredients, cooking styles, techniques, practices, quality, hygiene, health standards, branding, including the mythology around Indian food and drink, popularizing of Indian recipes, ingredients, while creating new and innovative ones, and much, much more. Isn't it high time? What do you think?